Welcome to the NATIS Balance and Mobility eSeminar Series. This is our first eSeminar scheduled for 2016. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Emily Keschner from Temple University. Dr. Keschner is Professor and Chair of the Department of Physical Therapy and Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Temple University. She is Director of the Virtual Environment and Postural Orientation Laboratory in the Nerve Laboratories at Temple University, which was developed for both experimental and clinical testing of postural reactions within a simulated dynamic visual environment. The laboratory was one of the first to incorporate a dynamic balance platform with a three-wall virtual reality environment. Dr. Keschner explores how conflicting sensory feedback demands influence the ability to organize effective postural behaviors and the computational processes used by the central nervous system to match conflicting environmental demands. Neural and biochemical components of complex whole body movements are examined during postural and orientation tasks. Studies are performed with several populations, including healthy adults and those with balance problems and central nervous system disorders, such as stroke and cerebral palsy, to understand how control parameters change with age and neurological deficit. The overall goal of this research is to develop new treatment interventions that will effectively reduce instability and falls in aging and clinical populations. Dr. Keschner has been continuously funded from the National Institutes of Health since 1989 and is past president of the International Society for Virtual Rehabilitation and the International Society of Posture and Gait Research. I would now like to turn the presentation over to our speaker, Dr. Emily Keschner from Temple University. Good morning. Today I'm going to speak to you about the effective use of virtual reality goggles for balance rehabilitation with various patient populations. This is some work, this will include work that I've done in my laboratory as well as some of the work of others in the field of physical therapy. Um, our learning objectives for this presentation are that participants will be able to describe the various types of virtual reality technology and the strengths and weaknesses of this technology as a rehabilitation intervention. To explain the effects of virtual reality goggles on the visual and perceptual systems. Three, identify the motor learning principles that can be met with virtual reality. And finally, be able to discuss some of the evidence for using virtual reality in the treatment of patients with stroke, cerebral palsy, vestibular disorders, and concussion. So what is virtual reality? Well, basically virtual reality is composed of a computer, a performer, and the output devices that create the environment. With virtual reality, we want to apply interactive simulations through the computer's hardware and software in order to present the user with opportunities to engage in environments that appear and feel similar to real world objects and events. So similar is the key word here. We're not creating a real world. We're creating a world that seems believable. What are the characteristics that make it virtual reality? Why would I call the cave that I use in my laboratory virtual reality and not the computer sitting on your desk? Well, first of all, we want immersion. We want our performance to be immersed in the world that is generated by the computer and not just view it from the outside. We want them to be able to participate in arm's length interaction with objects that are both real or virtual and with others, not always people, sometimes virtual avatars in the environment. The objects in the environment need to move in a natural fashion with the subject's motion. And in do, to do this, we need to track the movements of the head and eyes of our performer. 
Virtual reality is distinguished from other forms of visual imaging, such as video and television, by its interactive properties. And it can appear in several interfaces, such as head-mounted displays, projection-based systems, computer workstations, and can be either totally immersive or augmented reality, which allows you to view the actual physical world at the same time as you're performing in the virtual world. So, this is a slide showing or demonstrating some of the different forms of virtual reality with the change in immersion as you progress from one from left to right. The benefit of virtual reality is that it's standardized and it allows you to develop an individualized intervention within a purposeful context. So if we look at the left side of this slide where it says real environment, our users are actually in their physical environment using objects that they can see their motions on, their interactions with on the computer. So they can move those blocks and see what they've done on the computer interface. Then we get a little more involved in the virtual world as we use augmented reality. And with augmented reality, we can actually interact both with the, with the virtual object and with the physical objects so that we could, if you see the, the um, picture of the guy wearing the head-mounted display, he could actually see the real world through those goggles at the same time as he's seeing that virtual butterfly. And finally, we move to fully immersive virtual reality where your field of view, your visual field of view is totally covered by the virtual world. So here we have on the left side, an individual standing in front of a very wide screen so that unless he turns his head in one direction or the other, all he sees is that screen in his field of view. And then the fully immersive cave where you're standing in a room that is virtual and you see nothing else, no matter how you move, all you see is the projection of the virtual world around you. Comparing these systems shows some of their strengths and weaknesses. So head-mounted displays or goggles, as people like to say, um, use smaller screens that move with the viewer. So although it covers a full field of view, you're not really getting a full field of view. You can only see that virtual space, but your peripheral vision is somewhat limited by the size of the lenses in that head-mounted display. You cannot see your own body unless you've created an augmented reality display. These systems do add weight to the head, which does affect the posture and the motion that we will see. It's very difficult to participate with others because you can't see anything but what's projected in front of you. The hand, your hands and any tools you might use need to be virtual. And as we'll discuss a little bit later, we tend to experience cyber sickness with these goggles. The projection system is a larger fixed screen that is more distant from the viewer. So you're standing in front of it or within it. It's immersive, but not isolating so that you can interact with others through speech and sound, or you can even have someone else in the room with you. You can see your own body. You have unrestricted motion. You can interact with others while you're in the virtual world, or you can interact with virtual others. Your hands and tools are visible to you, and cyber sickness is less common. So although this system seems to have a more natural effect on the user. It's also much more expensive and more difficult to create in any environment because of the space it requires. The key is that virtual reality systems provide the real-time, viewer-centered, head-tracked perspective with a large angle of view, interactive control, and binocular display. So we can't just put somebody in front of a small computer screen 
and assume that they're working in virtual reality. We need several other components of the system. But what we found in clinics in the past 10 years or so with the advent of Nintendo Wii is that more and more people are trying to use off-the-shelf versions of virtual reality for rehabilitation. They're purchasing games to encourage the use of affected extremities. An example is the Nintendo Wii being used to work on weight-bearing and increasing coordination and increasing strength and stability and finding gross motor skills. This is wonderful because we found that indeed it is very motivating to our users. They have fun, they enjoy it, but there are some limitations to this software that we need to be very aware of. And those limitations are that the parameters of these interactions are not well controlled and are not really identified. We have no idea how much force the user is producing. We can't constantly track whether it's the whole limb or one joint that's being used to produce the movement. There are ways to trick many of these games. We don't know that the performer is moving as we expect them to. And finally, we've been unable to ascertain whether the children are truly motor learning or are they learning how to win a game. I caution you that active video games don't necessarily boost physical activity. There was a study done by Baranowski in which she gave children five active fitness focus games. Half of them received the fitness games, the other half inactive games. And they got all the things they needed to play these games. But when she tracked their activity levels with accelerometer logs, she found that the active games didn't promote any more exercise in these children than did the inactive video games. Now I'm going to play a little movie for you that's going to emphasize the point I'm trying to make. And here it is. You can see in this video the virtual individual is jumping and running and the real person, the performer, is standing on his little wee balance board and clicking his heels and making believe he's running and essentially bending his knees but never really clearing the ground in his jump. So you can see he can win the game with much less physical exertion and activity and not really perform the tasks that you're presenting to him and still accomplish his goal of winning this game. So given these weaknesses, why would we want to use simulated tasks in rehabilitation? Why do we even care about using virtual reality? It's expensive. We're not sure it works. What, what's the good things about it? Well, one, there is a convenience. You know, how often can we send somebody home with a game and say, okay, do this 10 times a day and you're going to get much stronger? And people say, cool, I love to play games. I'll do this 10 times a day, no problem. And so it's an easy way to get people to do home exercise programs or even exercise programs in the clinic. It's reasonably safe. It, we can grade the level of difficulty. We can obtain um, the knowledge of results and knowledge of performance data that we might want if we um, include ways of tracking that data. And Using virtual reality presents multitasking in intervention. And so the question is, do we really need multitasking? Do we want to focus only on the exercise as the goal, or do we want to put people in environments where they have to perform tasks that feel real and purposeful? And remember that VR is not meant to replace the real world action. It's meant to facilitate it. So if all of our patients were just walking in quiet gardens or sitting in our PT gyms or, or engaging in activities where um, there's nothing much else happening around them, we really don't need to worry about where they focus their attention, 
There's nothing to distract them. But we know that in natural environments, there are many things that can take our attention away from our actions. Usually other people, lots of visual effects, unstable floors, um, changing directions. So we're always receiving much more, many more um, inputs and, and demands on our attention and our, our movement planning than we would receive if we were just sitting in the PT gym or sitting in the safety of our living rooms. And virtual environments are ideal for creating this for, for our patients. They can provide conflicting sensory demands just like natural environments. And here's three examples of the ways virtual reality is being used. In the upper left Figure you see a laboratory with a person wearing a head-mounted display and walking through an environment and obviously interacting with something, using his hands to interact with something. So even though he's walking in a very safe, flat-floored environment with nothing around him, he is reacting to something and producing upper extremity motion. Underneath that, we see the Fung Lab at the Jewish Rehab Hospital in Montreal, where she has a widescreen projection of a virtual reality environment. When people are walking through that environment and encountering different images and obstacles as they walk on the treadmill. And then on your right, you see how Locomat, has, Hokuma is the company, has now added virtual reality to their gait training tasks so that individuals are, one, distracted, can be distracted, or can be engaged to try to produce very particular kinds of movements on the treadmill they were walking on. Going back to the Fung Lab, I want to show you some of the ways we can change the environment so that we can progress the therapy we're giving our patients. So if you look at level one, you see that there's no change in the surface, there's no obstacles, and no time constraint as the person walks through the hallway. Then we go to level two, and we see that there are changes in the surface. Um, they have now added a sense of incline. And the, um, at the very end, you can see there's a drop off in the floor. And then on level three, they add obstacles. They've added some other images of people in wheelchairs. And what they found was that with practice, their patients were able to increase gait speed to match these task demands, as well as adapt their gait to fit with the changes in the physical terrain. So although this was a virtual environment, people matched their gait, shape, and speed to fit into the, the um, topology of this environment. There's also studies showing that we can create very natural environments so we can look at navigation and socialization skills. This is a virtual action supermarket used by Weiss and Klinger in which they have the user or several users at a time go through the supermarket and select items they have to purchase. And you can see in the bottom two slides, they're showing the trajectories they tracked from these patients to follow how um, effective and efficient they were at producing, at meeting this task of shopping and motor planning. So virtual reality is very capable of addressing key issues in rehabilitation. And those issues I identify as how can we motivate our patients to engage in their rehabilitation, and how do we know what the intervention actually did so that we can then transfer it to help other patients. The physiological impact of virtuality is one way of knowing that we've made some change in our patients. There are known psychophysical phenomena that we can measure when someone is in virtual reality. These include immersion, presence, vection, and cybersickness. 
So let's start with immersion, which is basically the feeling of being inside the virtual world and a part of the virtual world. In order to achieve this, the user must be able to explore what appears to be a life-sized virtual environment. So this is, in order to get immersion, this is where we need something, a, a, an image that encompasses your full field of view. You need to be able to change your perspective seamlessly so that if you turn your head, the world will turn with you. You need to view objects in the environment from any angle. It needs to be three-dimensional. And your point of view should shift according to where you are looking. So just like in the real world, if you're looking to the right, you'll see the wall on the right. If you're looking to the left, you'll see what's on the wall on the left. In the virtual world, you expect the same. Here's an example of individuals who were truly immersed in their virtual world. We did a study on subjects in two environments. On the left, you see the individual standing in just a room of dots. So this is an amorphous virtual world. But they were in a cave, so that's all they saw. Or, as you can see on the bottom right, we had them in a room that looked sort of like an old temple with oriental rugs and columns and a horizon in the distance. And so we had a real, more concrete image of the world. And you can see what we did was spin the world around. You're seeing it right now. And so the subjects stood in this room, and they were able to take about seven or eight steps across the virtual room while they were looking at these randomly placed dots rotating with a constant velocity of 25 degrees per second or while observing the constant velocity turn of this room at five degrees per second. And what did we find? We found that indeed being immersed in a visual world changed motor planning. And it didn't matter whether the visual world was amorphous dots or what we called then the great hall of action, a recognizable concrete room. We essentially, um, observed two patterns of walking in our subjects. One pattern was of the top two slides, where the top two plots, where we find that the ankle, the trunk, and the head all stayed together as the individual took essentially one step forward and then started to fall towards the side in the direction of the turning of the virtual room. In the other environment, we see exactly the same thing, where ankle in red, trunk in pink, and head in yellow travel forward for a couple of steps, and then the individual starts to fall off to the side in the direction of the turning of the virtual world. The other strategy is in the two plots on the bottom. And these individuals, we found that they changed their posture by bending and flexing very much at the knee and at the head and in the ankle. So they crouched down. They lowered their center of mass before they took their steps and were able to walk forward but did so by stamping forward. And here it's even more obvious in this individual. And you can oh, see each stamp taking place. And so when we asked them, what did you do? What did you plan in this movement? The people who did the falling off to the side said, I knew I was falling, but I couldn't help myself. And the people who did the stamping forward said, I knew I would fall, and so I wasn't going to let that happen. And so in both cases, they had to organize their movement to counteract the force of that virtual world when it caused them to change the motor pattern they produced. We find that in an, 
a um, virtual world, young adults are very sensitive to both velocity and direction of visual motion. So here's an example of a young adult standing on a Neurocom platform, which tilted, um, stayed either flat, stable, as you see on the top, or tilted toes up. And we, found, and we presented the virtual world motion in a pitch up direction. So the world was moving around them up towards the ceiling. And we changed the velocities of that world. So in black, in, it was dark. They did not see the world. When it was yellow, in the yellow line, the world was on but not moving. And then in the blue, pink, and red, you see the world gradually increased its velocity. And what we find is that when the floor is stable, when they're in the dark or in a stationary visual world, they can stay stable. But when the world starts moving upward around them, they start falling backward. Or I'm sorry, forward, moving towards the world. And then when the toes go up so that they become physically unstable, we find that in the dark, they never fully compensate to return to a zero position. With the world stationary, they have a cue to where vertical is, so they get a little closer to the real world. But here, we can move the world around them and actually force them back towards neutral. And the amount of motion we bring them back is dependent on the velocity of that visual world. So now we have a tool. We have velocity of visual motion that can change orientation in space. So another cue to whether the virtual world is exacting an effect on our performer is the sense of presence. And with the sense of presence, you essentially become unaware of your real surroundings and focus on your existence in the environment. And studies have shown that this sense of presence can be influenced by features of the virtual environment, such as the type of games you use, the extent of the functionality, and the characteristics of the individual user. We find that young people tend to be more present in a virtual world than older people. And finally, the task itself. Are we scanning objects? Are we moving in that world? Or are we just sitting still and clicking on something? Virtual presence is very important if we want to have an effect on our performer. And it can be achieved without immersion and encumbrance. So on your left, you see the way a head-mounted display used to look many, many years ago. Quite overwhelming for the performer. Now, more modern times, we've reduced both weight and the um, amount of visibility required so that people can see the real world just by turning their eye. They can be present in the environment or they could leave it when they choose. If we combine immersion and presence, studies are starting to show that we actually have neuroplastic changes in our clients. These are some images of a child with cerebral palsy interacting with a virtual environment as a large screen field of view. And these are the images he sees. He can play with a ball and hit um, virtual objects like birds. He can throw things, or he can even get involved in a soccer game. This study was done by you et al. And they had children engage in these games for therapy. And they found that after a couple of months of therapy with these games, they actually saw on fMRI that there were neural changes in the affected limb. And that the child was then able to start to spontaneously perform tasks, such as reaching, self-feeding, and dressing none of which were possible before these interventions. So there is some carryover, there is some learning, there is some actual neuroplasticity, plus, uh, neuroplasticity change occurring when you interact with a virtual environment. This is another laboratory at Rutgers 
is a study done by Fouet, Marians, and Adamovic, in which they looked at people with stroke and hemiparesis, and they tried to encourage movement of the involved upper extremity. And as you can see, they gave them a game where they had to do individuated finger movements to play the piano. And they also gave them a game where they had to do a total grasp of a cup or some other object and place, so grasp and place. And they had subjects from 55 to 75 years old who were more than six months post-stroke um, engage in these activities for 10 to 20 minutes each, four sessions a week for two weeks, and then tested their outcome measures on the Fugelmeyer assessment, the Wolf Motor Function Test, and the Jepson Taylor Test of Hand Function. And what they found was that there were significant improvements in upper extremity motion, and they also found retention of these improvements for up to three months. This is a um, plot of how the hand motion changed over time. So this is a one, stroke, one subject with stroke after practicing for approximately three hours a day for eight days, so rather intensive therapy. But you can see this would be the dark black line would be the ideal cup placing motion. The dotted black line is showing um, how it was performed by that individual originally, and then after the training, how that individual improved in the placing task. Another uh, well-known psychophysical result of virtual reality is vection. And this is where the visual motion or the visual world produces the sensation of self-motion, and then that then produces some kind of motoric compensation. There's an understanding of what the physiology is underlying this experience of motion, and you, can, you are familiar with this. If you think of yourself standing on a train platform, and the train starts to move, and you start to feel yourself falling backward because you think, at one stroke, one subject with stroke after practicing for approximately three hours a day for eight days, so rather intensive therapy. But you can see this would be the dark black line would be the ideal cup placing motion. The dotted black line is showing um, how it was performed by that individual originally, and then after the training, how that individual improved in the placing task. Another uh, well-known psychophysical result of virtual reality is vection. And this is where the visual motion or the visual world produces the sensation of self-motion. And then that then produces some kind of motoric compensation. There's an understanding of what the physiology is underlying this experience of motion. And you, can, you are familiar with this. If you think of yourself standing on a train platform and the train starts to move and you start to feel yourself falling backward because you think you're moving, not the train. And it's really that sense of the train is filling your field of view and it's hard to believe that your field of view is moving so you let your body move to compensate. So vection is really an illusion of self-motion produced by the visual world motion. And the reason this occurs is because we're receiving otolith signals telling us that our gravitational vector is constant. But then we're receiving these huge visual signals telling us that something's moving. And our brain puts it together and says, well, it can't be the world moving. It must be me moving. So we get a perception of tilt. And that leads to vection. So here's an example. If the world starts to turn counterclockwise, we get a perception that we are turning opposite from the world. And what we will do is then compensate for the sense that we are turning and allow us to tilt in the direction of the real world. We will tilt in a counterclockwise motion. 
And here's an example of how we've used this phenomenon in my laboratory. We have looked at healthy elderly and at patients with stroke, and we've put them uh, in the cave on a platform where they're looking either in the dark, where they're standing in the dark, uh, and or the world is pitching up around them at 45 degrees per second, that's the blue, or pitching up around them at 30 degrees per second, that's the red. Or if the world is pitching downward in front of them at 45 and 30 degrees, the pink and green. And we tried to determine whether we could influence the postural orientation of these individuals, and we found that indeed we can, that most in fact, all of the subjects to varying degrees would actually move in the direction of the world to compensate for the real world motion. So we, the responses, these strong overall whole body, this is center of mass, whole body responses to direction and velocity of the virtual scene tells us that virtual reality could be a training tool for balance disorders. So the last factor in virtual reality that we want to actually avoid is cyber sickness. And if any of you are gamers, you probably have experienced cyber sickness at some point in your life. And cyber sickness is the result of a conflict between visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive systems during or after immersion. One of the reasons we get this is there's a delay, an update latency delay between the time that we move and the time that the system resets itself to match what our head and eyes are doing. And humans are very skilled at detecting visual lags. We can detect lags that are greater than 50 milliseconds. And if we get these lags, we are no longer immersed in the environment, we are actually starting to feel that it doesn't match our own movements. And we know that there are very intimate connections between the vestibular system, the ocular system, and the autonomic nervous system, so that with cyber sickness, we get strong experiences of dizziness, nausea, and even vomiting. So it's something you want to not have. So if you're going to purchase an off-the-shelf system, you want to be certain that patients aren't going to experience long lags between their own motion and the update of the virtual environment. There's a lot of research starting to be generated showing us that virtual reality does have a strong impact. And this is research you can easily look up, just type in virtual reality and physical therapy, virtual reality and intervention, virtual reality and rehabilitation, and you'll find many position papers, lit reviews, and meta-analyses. And although most of them are small sample, single-site clinical studies, the support is starting to come out, showing effectiveness of virtual reality as a clinical tool. And the reason we think that virtual reality has a significant correspondence with improvement in rehabilitation is that virtual reality affordances correspond well with rehabilitation principles. For, oops, sorry. For example, we have high intensity repetitive exercise. We, the performer has a knowledge of their own performance and the results of their performance. They are motivated, so they increase their participation. The Activities can be graded so that they're demanding but still feasible. They, can, they don't have to go beyond the ability of each performer. The activities can be varied, meaningful, and purposeful. And finally, we can document the client's performance so we can keep track of the fact that there is a change over time. And in that respect, virtual reality can be used as an outcome measure of these rehabilitation games. So if we want to present a more complex task in the virtual environment with multiple motor demands, then we use for intervention, 
we can actually examine or explore whether there's some carryover from the intervention. And I'm going to give you an example of this in a minute, but what I suggest is that testing within a virtual environment will aid in differential diagnosis of syndromes that have poorly defined clinical signs. And the patient can't really explain what their issue is. You can put them in these environments and observe their movement at many levels. You can train within the virtual environment to elicit measurable rehab outcomes and use it as a clinical tool for evaluating and training those movements in environments that closely reflect the conditions they will experience in the physical world. So this is a study in which we tried to do some balance training of individuals with labyrinth and dis disorders on a moving platform in our virtual reality cave. And the movie you're seeing is really a healthy young adult who's standing on a sway reference platform. This is the Neurocom platform that was created by Lou Nashner for our laboratory. Now we have the same individual standing on the sway reference platform and the scene will begin to roll around him. And you can see as soon as the scene started to turn, he started to lean uh, to the right. And now he's trying a pointing task. And you'll see that even for a healthy individual, this is a very difficult multitasking event. He actually starts to lose his balance. So we use this as an evaluative measure, an evaluation of improvement. And what we did was test our patients with vestibular, a bilateral labyrinth and vestibular deficit in this environment before they started training. Then we had them train for a two-week period in the dark, and we increased the sensitivity of the sway referencing on the platform each day until it was about two times that of their own center of mass motion. And we just told them to focus on the position of their hips and knees. So they were paying attention to their own interoceptive feedback. And then we put them back into the cave and tested them with this test once again. And this is an example of a 73-year-old female who had 10 years post-onset of bilateral vestibular deficit. She was an active community dweller, but she said she would tend to fall at least once a week. She had no other significant health problems. And we found that in pre-training, she had a lot of difficulty maintaining her balance on that sway reference platform when the scene was moving. Two weeks later in post-training, she had really been able to control her sway and reduce the center of pressure um, profile. What was most interesting to us was that we sent her home and told her to come back in two weeks. And two weeks later, she had reduced that profile even more. And when we asked her how she was feeling, she said she felt much more confident walking around in her environment. She wasn't as afraid to go out to the supermarket. So our sense is that there was success. It was training of attention to proprioceptive feedback and that virtual reality served as a unique tool to stress her system so that we could see that change had taken place. We actually have continued this kind of training now with individuals' head injury, and, such as concussion and stroke. And you can see in our little movie that we've been using just, we call it the universe, an image with lots of dots in front of them that fills, fills the field of view. And they stand on a sway reference platform. And in this case, when we train them, not only did we train them just by putting them on the sway reference platform, but we also added plantar vibration to the soles of the feet because there is evidence of the literature that plantar sole vibration will improve balance. And again, we have a plots here showing that a patient with stroke, when he first came in prior to the training, was very unstable and actually would fall backward 
off the platform when confronted with this upwardly moving visual field. But then after training, he was able to stay much closer. He was able to keep his orientation closer to upright. And this is his center of mass pattern on the left. And you can see the same behavior going on in the center of pressure here on the right. So what is the actual clinical value of virtual reality? One is we get a knowledge of results and a knowledge of performance through visual, and we can even add auditory feedback. The intensity of these effects can be modified to challenge patients at their own level. We can engage the users in their training to allow for repetitive, intensive practice that is really required for behavioral motor plasticity. We all know that with the limits in reimbursement, it is very difficult to see our patients as often or for the, as long as we feel is necessary to, for motor learning to take place. If we can send them home with interventions that are directed towards their individual needs and just update those interventions as over time, we have a chance of influencing them for a longer period of time. We can induce activity through observation. So by watching movement, people tend to perform movement. And we can tailor these interventions to address the particular needs of each patient. Virtual reality strength and rehabilitation is that it encourages motor learning through practice and repetition. And it provides environments that we can use to assess dynamic tasks performed every day, but under controlled circumstances, so that we're keeping patients in safe environments, but presenting them with the kinds of demands they might experience in the real world. So why wouldn't we choose virtual reality? Why would you not want to use it? Well, there are some things we need to really keep in mind that influence our movement when we're in a virtual reality environment. We need to determine whether donning external devices, such as goggles, gloves, or haptic feedback, helmets, disturb the patient performance because of the weight, the discomfort, and the isolation. So choosing the type of virtual reality you you use might depend very much on the comfort level of that performer with that technology. We need to know the way in which the patient is represented in the virtual environment. Do they see themselves as an avatar, a virtual image? Do they see themselves in the environment moving themselves? Or do they see someone else altogether? Do does this give them a sense of presence, and how does it affect their performance? Are they mimicking the avatar exactly? Are they changing their movement if they see their own movement and not someone else's, or are they just doing what they've constantly done? What kind of feedback do we need to give them about their movement? We need to know how the patient navigates or manipulates objects within the virtual environment. For instance, do they have to use a tracker or a joystick, or can they actually use their limb? So thinking back to the presentation I showed where people were playing the piano, they were actually making those movements by pressing on a switch on a robot. So they weren't actually making those individual finger movements themselves. And there's a question of whether learning to make those movements would occur unless they actually made them. So how does the navigation and manipulation of objects affect the sense of presence and the ultimate performance? With what frequency or severity does a particular virtual reality platform or environment produce cyber sickness? If somebody gets sick in your environment, they're not going to want to go back too often. So we need to monitor that. And finally, we need to examine different segments of the population, men versus women, elderly versus young, to see if some are more susceptible than others to being present and to being cybersick. 
So finally, I want to conclude by making some solid, some strong statements. Virtual reality, I believe, is a motivating and safe tool for rehabilitation purposes. Virtual reality can be used both as an intervention and an outcome measure of rehabilitation gains. And what we really need are to determine the dosages for applicability to motion in the physical world. An accurate transfer of training needs to be further verified. But in conclusion, virtual reality definitely can be an effective rehabilitation tool. I want to thank you for listening. On behalf of Natus Balance and Mobility, I'd like to thank Dr. Keschner for delivering this excellent presentation on virtual reality. Also, please visit our website, nervecenter.natus.com, for a listing of upcoming e-seminars for 2016. On our website, you'll also find a library of recorded e-seminars available for on-demand learning. Thank you.